Hey, I'm Jeff. About a year ago, I decided I wanted to get back into motorcycling. I've had dirt bikes and street bikes over the years, but I always wanted a bike that I could just take off from the garage, hit the highways, ride these back roads, find some dirt and gravel roads, maybe even hit a few jumps. I wanted a bike that could do it all, and a dual sport seemed like the right bike for me. So I went online and started reading and watching reviews like we do these days to figure out what was the best bike for me. And as you can see, I ended up with the Yamaha WR250R. Yet after only 10 months and 5,000 miles, I've chosen to sell this bike. How can that be? I did my homework. I found the best dual sport there is. And at the end of the day, I look back to some of the reviews that I read and watched and realize I was being a little bit misled. Many of those reviews tout the many, many positive qualities of this bike, but gloss over some of the key weaknesses that you should know about. So in my video today, I hope to share with you those weaknesses and the reasons I'm selling so you can make an informed decision about whether this bike is the right bike for you. Before I go into the reasons why I'm selling, I first owe this bike some compliments. Yamaha builds a great machine. I've ridden this bike over 5,200 trouble-free miles, all doing just regular service. This bike has long service intervals. It's very reliable. It's robust. It's a great machine, and if you use it for its intended purpose, I think you'll be really happy with it. With all those positives, why am I selling? Well, it comes down to really one key reason, which is highway capability, or lack of. So I'm gonna break that down today in four reasons, which include engine horsepower, fuel economy, fuel range, and safety. We'll start with engine horsepower, which is really just speed. This bike is rated at 87 miles per hour, but it can't actually do that. If you ride this bike in sixth gear at full throttle on flat ground with no headwind, you're gonna max out about 80 to 85 miles per hour. You can downshift to fifth, and maybe you get to 87, but this engine is screaming so fast, it's not a way that you could reasonably ride for an extended period. But this speedometer lies. You're not actually going 80 to 85 miles an hour. You're going more like 70 to 75 miles per hour. I found the speedometer compared to a GPS is reading high by at least 10%. So when you see that video that shows this bike zipping along at 55, they're going 47. When you see them zipping along at 70, they're really going 60. So keep that in mind. Its actual speed is much slower and just barely keeps up with traffic. But I didn't buy this bike to be an interstate cruiser. That's not what a dual sport is. So it's not a deal breaker for me, but this still comes into play when riding just the back roads as well. If I see a car cruising along, my rule is that I won't pass it unless the car is going below 50 miles per hour. Above 50 miles per hour, this bike does not have the acceleration to get out and pass that car safely and efficiently and get back in your lane. This makes it a poor highway bike, even when commuting to the trails. This problem is potentially fixable. I read online that people do some common mods to this machine, which include airbox mods, ECU mods, a different pipe, or maybe even a big bore kit. But I don't really recommend those. You're gonna put a lot of money into this machine for a very marginal gain in horsepower. This bike needs more than a marginal gain. It needs a lot of gain to be capable at 50 to 60 miles per hour. The other reason I don't recommend it is this bike wasn't made to do that. The engineers who came up with this engine designed all these parts to work together as a system. And when you start modifying this system, starting with the amount of torque it puts into the crank, you're loading up the entire drivetrain to loads higher than it was designed for. You're gonna see problems with that. And the reason why we buy this bike is reliability. This engine is super reliable. And anything you do to change this engine is gonna reduce its reliability, hurt its emissions, make it louder, and make it not the quality reliable bike that you bought. If you run an engine to high loads for an extended period, you shouldn't expect great fuel economy. And that's been my experience. As you'll see in other reviews, this bike is rated at 71 miles per gallon, but that's not the actual fuel economy you'll achieve. I have achieved it on a few tanks, but those were when I was riding at very mellow speeds below 50 miles per hour with minimal acceleration. For more typical riding, getting up to 60 miles per hour, uh, accelerating out of corners, having a good time on the bike, I typically get 50 to 55 miles per gallon, which is a lot less than 71. But remember, the speedometer is off by 10%, so the odometer is off by that much as well. So when I adjust it for that, I'm only getting 45 to 50 miles per gallon. That's about the same, if not slightly worse, than of my bigger 1,000cc adventure bike cruising at the same speeds. Fuel economy is just another way of saying the cost per mile to run this machine. So I want to point out the sticker that indicates this bike requires premium fuel. And premium fuel around here costs about 25% more than regular fuel. So if my big adventure bike is getting the same fuel economy as this one, it's actually more expensive to ride this bike than a bigger adventure bike. Or to put it a different way, 
That means that this bike is getting 50 miles per gallon on premium fuel. A bigger adventure bike getting 40 miles per gallon actually costs the same per mile. This bike, while supposedly great fuel economy at 70 miles per gallon, doesn't live up to great fuel economy or cost per mile in practice. This brings me to range. This bike has a 1.9 gallon fuel tank. And if you do the math at 71 miles per gallon, you get more than 130 miles of range. But keep in mind this bike is only getting about 50 miles per gallon. So what that means in practice is after about 80 miles the fuel light comes on, and by 100 miles you've run out completely. So for me, when I'm cruising along and the light comes on, I immediately pull over, I look up the nearest gas station that sells premium fuel, and I drive there. Practically, that means that anytime I'm over 60 miles, I'm looking for the next gas station and filling up there. It gets really, really old having to stop this often for fuel. Unlike the other problems I've talked about, this problem is solvable for a reasonable amount of money. There are several manufacturers that make extended range tanks for not a lot of money that could fix this problem, but I chose not to for a few reasons. One is, this is a dual sport bike, and I want it to be narrow and have that lightweight capability off-road. And adding fuel up high and extra size isn't going to match with the intent of this dual sport bike. Also, adding more weight and wind resistance isn't going to help the first problem with horsepower. So for me, it just didn't make sense to upgrade the fuel tank. So what works for me? I typically carry along a small tank of gas when I'm out on a ride that I know I'm not going to see many gas stations, just as an extra safety, and yet I always stop it for gas whenever I see a station, whenever I'm above about 60 miles, and it's worked. The final reason, maybe most important reason, I'm selling this bike is safety. This bike does not have ABS brakes, and I think that if you're riding significant time on the highway, you should have ABS brakes. I have a lot of experience riding motorcycles, and I know how to brake really hard, transferring the weight to the front wheel, and nearly lifting the back end off the ground to get the maximum braking performance out of this machine. But in a panic stop, you want every advantage you have, including electronic aids, to stop you as quick as you absolutely could. I was in a situation where I was cruising down a highway, and two deer are in a soybean field, and we are on a path where we're going to collide. So, first of all, it'd be great if I could have accelerated out of that situation and ended up in front of them. But this bike doesn't have enough horsepower to do that. So I switched to braking. And I braked really hard, and I was able to stop and avoid them when they went across the road. I was fortunate because it was on a nice sunny day, dry roads, no worries about braking really hard. But if it was in slick conditions, or if there's sand or other debris on the road that I couldn't see or affects my braking, it would have maybe been a little bit different situation. So therefore, I really recommend ABS brakes to give you every advantage you can. The lack of ABS brakes is the true reason I'm really selling this bike, because all the other issues aren't ideal, but I've lived with them just fine for over 5,000 miles. They're nuisances, they can maybe be solved with some money, but ABS and safety isn't something I want to risk, and I want to spend money to have a different machine with more safety. So after all that, do I hate this bike? Absolutely not. This is a great bike. It's just great for its intended purpose. And I think its intended purpose is a situation we're gonna be riding at less than 50 miles per hour most of the time. That means urban commuting, back roads, dirt trails, places where you're really gonna appreciate the reliability and power of this bike at those lower speeds. When you push it above those speeds, you're gonna find that this engine just doesn't have the power. You're gonna see poor fuel economy. You're gonna run out of fuel really fast. And it's just not a safe bike for those highway situations. So hopefully this helps explain why I'm selling the bike so you can make an informed decision yourself if this bike is right for you. Thanks for watching and ride safe.